Scott Barry Kaufman is on a mission to prove anyone, even those without readily identifiable gifts, can be great. Kaufman himself was imprisoned in grade school by a learning disabled label. He was thought to be ungifted, uninspired, and a slow learner. When cognitive psychologist Kaufman graduated with honors from three prestigious universities, Carnegie Mellon, Cambridge, and Yale, he went in search of the one teacher who helped save him from the slow class. Today, he focuses his beautiful mind and his scientific research on redefining intelligence and the many paths to intellectual greatness. His new book is called Ungifted, Intelligence Redefined. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Scott Kaufman to Vancouver. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, nice to meet you. Nice to man of big brain, once thought to be man of little brain. <laughs> Or boy of little brain. <laughs> fair enough. Mm -hmm. fair. I, don't really, I, I don't really know what the size of my brain is. but um, <laughs> I don't think it matters. <laughs> brain power. Yeah, brain power. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think I try to maximize um, whatever I have, you know, and I think that's uh, important for everyone to do that, you know. Take me back to grade school when someone okay. labeled you learning disabled, slow. Yeah, I, so I had a lot of fluid in my ears when I was really young. The first three years of my life, uh, my mom counted, I had 21 ear infections, and it made me, uh, I was essentially deaf for the first three years of my life. I, I couldn't uh, hear or process, I just like heard a whooshing sound. And so they put me in special education, um, as you know, um, which is a fair thing to do for, you know, special education serves its purpose, you know, for helping kids that need um, services. But they, they kept me in it um, unquestioningly. Um, as my, I, I felt like every year that went on, my uh, my self esteem sort of went lower and lower, mm -hmm. and uh, and even I, I had an operation to remove the fluid, and I felt like I was processing things better, and I felt like I was ready for more intellectual challenges. But I kind of kept. Um, that to myself, that I felt like I wanted more intellectual challenges. Because when you're a kid, you know, you don't question the authority or the, um, the experts, mm -hmm. you know. So I kept it all, and I had this whole rich fantasy world I kept to myself, you know. I came, I came home and, and keep it all hidden. I wrote about, I, I was obsessed with time travel, and I wrote stories about time travel, and I, uh, I was really interested in the computer, and uh, my grandmother bought me the Apple II GS, you know. Really? So now it gives you an idea mm -hmm. of my age, I guess. Um, and I, I was so, and I programmed, I used to program, write computer programs on it, and stuff, and but I didn't tell anyone about this stuff, right? And uh, um, you know, who was I to question anyone? And did your parents feel you belonged in the challenged class because of your ear issue? Your parents? Yeah, I think that they also didn't question. Um, my my uh, parents had the best of intentions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an only. Uh, Child, I almost an only parent. <laughs> I was like, that's not what I mean to say. I was an only child, um, you know, and uh, of I would say um, a, a overprotective mother. I think there's, you know, I think she would even admit that, you know, God bless her, mm -hmm. um, uh, very loving, caring, and I think she always her her what what stemmed from with her was she wanted to lessen my load. She wanted to make sure I didn't suffer, right? So, but but sometimes we, you know, as parents, we need to kind of uh, introduce challenges. Sure. So you growth. know in your heart and your soul, you are not slow and you knew. Who saved you or who gave you an option to be in another class? So I was kept in special education all the way up until ninth grade, high school. Mm -hmm. And I remember the day quite vividly um, in the spring of my freshman year in high school, there was a new, there was like a teacher in the special ed classroom who, who was covering for the regular teacher. And she saw my frustration. So she saw me for the first time with a fresh set of eyes. Um, and I think she was the first time in my, in my life, uh, first person to really, to really truly see me, not the label. Mm -hmm. She came up to me and uh, she took, after class, she, she said, you know, I see your frustration and, um, uh, and boredom. And, uh, you know, what are you doing in special education? Um, and um, I tried to, I started to answer that question and realized I had no answer to that question. And it was like a light bulb went off for me. Something, you know, switched. And so she brought you into the back door of her class, not yeah. legally, really, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. let you audit her class, if you will. So that's another person who believed in me. So that's a different person. Oh, okay, person. different person. Two, I would say there's there's multiple people that have really um, really influenced my life greatly. Mm. So that first person was a special ed teacher. But then fast forward four years, I wanted to see if I could be get into gifted education. Um, you know, um, I felt like I was you know I was getting straight A's by this point after being a C student in special ed, and I wanted more intellectual challenges. Okay. And so I did. Yeah. So the label. Uh, as we've grown up with, uh, uh, put labels on cans, not on people. Yeah. And yet we live in a society that over-evaluates and over-labels. 
Yeah, we really do. Labeling serves a purpose for creating a need, for giving people special resources. So it can, in our current education system, labeling serves a useful purpose. But we don't need to live in this world. There's no um, reason why we still have to live with such outdated uh, models of education that um, treats it as though it's like uh, factory workers, you know, like we're mm -hmm. processing students to um, increase the output of the school itself, right? In, in sort of um, a grand, um, in, in terms of a, a reconceptualization of education, I think there's a place um, where we can uh, appreciate everyone's unique talents, passions, and inclinations in a way that we don't have to put those labels on. But I am clear saying under the current paradigm, the labels do serve some useful purposes. But um, I think that um, in the long run, they're, they're harmful um, because these labels get internalized into people's child's identity in unhelpful ways. How do you redefine intelligence? Oh boy, <laughs> let's get right down to <laughs> Have it. Have you got a couple of days? Get right down to it. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I think what I've um, what I've been what I'm trying to do, sort of like my uh, one of my main missions, is not so much um, redefine uh, or change the conceptualization of what the word intelligence means, so that it's distorted so much that it no longer has any meaning. What I've been trying to do is redefine or or broaden the way um, uh, the, the assessments of intelligence. Mm. So I argue for a more so we can still you know intuitively for um, say intelligence is the learning potential ability to. Uh, for basic intellectual functions like memory, um, uh, 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 re abstract reasoning, um, your ability to learn something in the classroom um, efficiently and fairly quickly. So let's, let's, let's grant for a moment, let's say that's intelligence. What I, my argument is, is that I think there are a lot more kids capable of displaying their brilliance, even in that definition, if we give them lots of different ways to express it. Well, uh, how often have we heard, uh, look what he or she has achieved despite low intelligence? I hate, I hate that. Yeah, so um, if we simply equate intelligence with IQ score, which um, a lot of people do, um, then you get funny paradoxes like that. And do you think yeah. IQ score means much? Really? It means something. It means something, and to and to, to those individuals who are very high IQ, it, to a lot of them it means something to them. So like I'm a Mensa. Right, and there are there are adults who say, you know, I'm a gifted adult, mm -hmm. right, and that's part of their identity. So I don't want to take that away from them, okay, because okay. That's, that, it brings them a sense of identity. But I think that it's it's one source of human variation, right? And there's so many sources of human variation we should appreciate. And talent, innate talent. That's, Absolutely, um, and and talent is, is an interesting thing because there's no such thing as innate talent. That's a, a misconception um, that we, we keep perpetuating. The truth is that ta all talents develop, no matter what they are. Michael Jordan didn't pop out dunking the basketball from the free throw line, right? right. Okay, he needed to develop those abilities. Yes. Practice, practice, practice. Right, but it was a combination. It was an intricate intricate combination of his unique passions, his drive to win and dominate, interacting with his practice. So these factors um, are, 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 you can't, uh, ex you can't tear them apart from each other. Right, uh, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? You're a cellist. Well. <laughs> you practice, practice, practice. Ultimately, you practice, practice, mm -hmm. practice. But what fuels that practice, and that, that's what interests me, is, is what are the drivers of that motivation to sustain that motivation? Good question, what are the drivers? So grit is one, this sort of this uh, ability to um, overcome obstacles, um, a sort of growth mindset where you believe that everything is a learning opportunity. You're not, you're not failing ultimately. And I think, and if you had to ask me, um, one of the most important is engagement. So deep personal connection or love um, to a particular material. Once you have that love for something, mm. it, everything kind of falls into place from there. We don't need to like force people to be gritty. I think we can have grit naturally come from engagement. If you're inspired by something and you get into the flow, you talk to any great artist or musician, and when they're practicing or when they're painting, they lose sense of time. It's their soul on canvas. It's called the flow state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, people who are in flow, are, that's, that's the deepest form of engagement. You've lost all sense of time because your mental, your mind, and your soul, and your, uh, probably a scientist using the word soul is not good, but your mind, <laughs> your emotions, everything comes connected so your full concentration and absorption is on the task itself. Do what you love. 
It's true. Um, mm -hmm. the, the famous uh, creativity researcher E. Paul Torrance found that uh, falling in love with a dream, with a future dream of yourself, was the most important predictor of lifelong creative achievement, better than any measure of academics. The Torrance Manifesto. You've read the Torrance Manifesto? I've read the Torrance Manifesto. I love the Torrance Manifesto. It's in this book. It's one I of the best I try to live my life every, by the Torrance yeah. Every kid should have this, right? Don't be afraid to fall in love with something and pursue it with intensity. That's right. Uh, free yourself to play your own game. Find a teacher or mentor who will help you. That's right. Who is your mentor? I've had so many mentors along the way, right? So starting Memorable in high mentor. school. Memorable mentors. <laughs> you know, so Anne Faye um, sticks out um, as someone who really took my dream seriously to get into Yale, PhD, with study Robert Sternberg. When I was in college, I took her cognitive psychology class. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that class, I said, look, this is my dream. And she said, let's, let's do it. Let's make it happen. And there's, it's so powerful. So powerful. Mm -hmm. And uh, you uh, sat once in a class with Jerome Singer That's right. as a student. Uh, he's a clinical psychologist, right? That's correct, yeah. And he talked to you about daydreaming, the importance of daydreaming. Is that something that we connected on at like a friendship level, right? We bonded over our, we're both big daydreamers. Mm -hmm. And um, I took his class and I immediately felt a connection to him and um, used to then would have some meetings with him. And we, it, it came out that we both love daydreaming. He's actually the father of daydreaming research. Right. And uh, how many times did I hear as a child or you hear as a child, stop daydreaming? Pay attention. Stop daydreaming. Well, I think that that's a very common sort of idea mm -hmm. is that we need to get kids to concentrate on the external lecture and, you know, self-control and, sit, you know, sit their butt in the seat. And, uh, but it's actually detrimental to um, lots of things that we should care about as parents and educators, like well-being, um, uh, uh, future goal planning, you know, identity formation, creativity, divergent thinking, all these things all right. come from that inner stream of consciousness. Yes, and they're the key drivers to success. I agree. Agree? I do agree. Uh, in creativity, uh, the way creativity can be stifled, you say, and I believe, uh, everybody's creative, every human. Yeah, so people talk a lot about creative, how can we increase creative expression in the classroom? Mm -hmm. I think creative expression is the same thing as self-expression. I think it's as simple as that. I think instead of, of trying to teach kids to be creative, right, say, be creative now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> mm. Fanny, be creative now. You know, we, what we should be doing is creating the conditions for self-expression. Exactly. Allow it. There is a, the great story about uh, the young child in art class who was drawing God. Mm -hmm. And the teacher said, no one knows what God looks like. And she said, or he said, they will in a minute. I love it. Mm -hmm. Great <laughs> I, story. I uh, we'll it. come back. Ungifted, Intelligence Redefined by Scott Barry Kaufman.